The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, uh, just briefly mention the three theories of consciousness that I think are taken seriously in neuroscience. Um, I'll say something about the explanatory gap and why that's relevant to the, these three theories. Then I'll say something general about first order versus higher order theories. And uh, then I'll go on from there, and uh, we'll look at this again later. So first, the three theories. So the first theory is the higher order theory of consciousness. That is, what it is to have a conscious pain is to have a pain accompanied by another state that is about that pain. Um, and that's what makes the pain a conscious pain. So the intuition here is if you had two animals, say, both of whom have a pain, but only one of them has a, say, a thought about that pain. That's, that one would be having a conscious pain and the other one would not. That's the, the sort of pick the idea of it. Um, now, this view comes in both higher order thought and higher order perception versions. Here's a bunch of historical figures, uh, well, some of them historical, uh, um, uh, uh, John Locke historical, the rest uh, uh, contemporary, who have held this view. Um, and uh, I'll, get, I'll say more about this view later. The second view, which I think is, I don't know, my estimation of, is that of people who, in neuroscience and psychology, who work on consciousness, I think most of them are likely to have this view. So, uh, the view was first put this global workspace theory, first was performed by Bernard Bars, and then some simulation, nice simulation work was done by Stan Nahan and John Bridge And at some point, uh, Dan Dennett uh, jumped on the bandwagon with his idea of consciousness as fame in the brain. That is, what it is for a representation in the brain to be conscious is to be famous with respect to other representations. So this is a picture from uh, some uh, uh, paper by Dahan. And uh, the idea is this. The, the, so the outer ring here is the sensory periphery. The inner part is frontal-based thought networks. And uh, rings going in are get more and more central. Each circle, each one of these little circles, is a, a neural processor, which doesn't mean a neuron, but it means some uh, collection of neurons, that some, some, something that does a processing job. The um, gray ones are inactive, the black ones are active, and the lines show the, uh, the connection. So the idea is, uh, of, of this model is that you have Sensory stimulations uh, that are that are um, uh, that impinge on the outer um, circle. Um, sometimes they form little coalitions, little neural networks, and that is one of these circles with the with some kind of reverberating signal in them. And sometimes those those little uh, networks actually trigger an internal network, which then um, um, feeds back to the peripheral network. And the idea is that these, uh, the, these um, um, uh, when that when that happens, then you have a workspace activation, in which the sensory activation is made available to all consuming systems in the brain at once, and that underlies the idea we have that when we have a conscious experience. Of, um, it can be used by our planning, our reporting, um, our memory, um, um, our decision making, um, uh, a whole lot of you know, what, what are sometimes called consuming systems in the brain. And, and the idea is that what it is for 
a representation to be a conscious representation is simply to be globally broadcast in that way. So that's the global broadcasting account. Um, the third of the three is what one might think of the, uh, as the biological theory. That is, the consciousness is some kind of neural state. These are some um, historical figures in philosophy, but the view is, I think, first really made um, 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 uh, into a, a viable program by uh, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch. And um, it's a little hard to, I think, at first to quite see the difference between this and the global broadcasting view, but I'll say a bit more about what the difference is. So this is a monkey brain. This is just a sort of fixed ideas. Um, this is a little slice out of the visual cortex. So the idea is we can think of the content of the visual experience of motion as maybe, this is just like a guess that we use for illustration, as some kind of a recurrent loop between this area V5 and V1. The idea is you've got signals going back and forth between V5 and V1, and that's what creates the content of the experience of motion. But on this view, there's a difference between that content and what makes that content conscious. Um, so here are some things that have been proposed as to what makes that content conscious. Um, high activation, the, the, the loop of the corticothalamic loop from the cortex down to the thalamus in the middle of the brain. Maybe a special kind of computation, as for example suggested by Giulio Tononi although he thinks it's a standalone account. Another possibility is suggested by a number of people is that there are certain self-oriented circuits that have to be activated. So the critical question, which I'm not going to be able to go into uh, today, is um, what the, really what the difference is between this and the global workspace account. What I'm really going to be mainly talking about is the first order versus higher order where both the biological and the global workspace account are, are first order, and the higher order account is a kind of theory. But I'll say just very briefly that if you hold this kind of a theory, you have room for um, a conscious experience that involves activation in the back of the brain that, that where, where those contents are conscious because of one of these things even though you don't have global broadcasting in the front of the head. So that's probably the clearest way to see how there might be a difference between these views. Um, more abstractly, the idea is that this view allows that um, um, uh, conscious experience is a certain kind of brain activation that um, um, uh, has to be described at a lower level. The global workspace account is something that in its usual forms works equally well on a computer as on a, is in a brain. So the global workspace account is making a bet as to the level of abstractness required to specify consciousness. The idea is that the matter doesn't matter. Um, it's, what that ma it's what those signals do that count in those signals, and what those signals do can be described in this very abstract way in terms of a global workspace that could be equally well be implemented in many different things. If you think that there is a possibility that something might function um, a lot like a um, um, consciousness functions in people, but that there, but it, but that it might be a zombie. You know, many of you may have seen the um, old Star Trek movie on Commander Data, where he's a, a robot made who you know acts just like the person, and then the issue comes up as to whether he's really conscious or not, and there's a trial about it. So if you find that intelligible, that it's possible that Commander Data might not actually be having conscious experiences but he might nonetheless have a global workspace, then you are, you're seeing a wedge between the global workspace view and this more brainy view. The idea being that maybe, say for example, something about the electrochemical nature of the way the brain works really is crucial um, to consciousness. So neurons signal each other via chemicals. Well, what if you just simulate that in the brain? Is that going to be something that is enough for consciousness? So there is this difference between the biological account and the global workspace account. Um, but I'm not going to uh, uh, go into that much. 
Um, what I'm going to do is say a little bit about the, uh, the advantages of these three views, and then um, so here are I think the key intuitive advantages. Um, the global workspace view, I think this is a little thermometer of intuitiveness. Um, the global workspace view captures this common sense idea that a conscious state, as I said, is one that is available to all these consuming systems at once. That's kind of a intuitive advantage. The high order view captures this transitivity principle that a conscious state is a state that one is conscious of being in. And that's a very intuitive principle, and so I think that's a plus for the higher order view. The biological view, I think, is the least immediately plausible of these, and that assuming it allows you to see a difference between it and the global workspace view. But I think its intuitive plausibility is a little more subtle. Um, often, people have the sense that there's more in their conscious experience than they can cognize. So you look around the room, you see this rich array of colors and textures and shapes, and you know before you know it, most of it is gone. And it doesn't seem possible to capture that in any kind of cognition. So that sense that not everybody has, but a lot of people have, um, is that there's something elusive about uh, the character of conscious experience um, that can all be captured in thought. That elusiveness is a plus for the biological theory because the idea is um, that um, the, um, uh, there's more, both more, both finer grain and more um, uh, capacity in the in the phenomenology of perception that is that gets into that, that is categorizable in this global workspace or that can be thought about in terms of higher order thought. So those are just now uh, it's important, of course, that uh, these intuitive advantages aren't just the beginning, right? It might motivate you to to push for one rather than another, but that shouldn't be what decides it. After all, it should we should think it's an empirical issue what the right theory of consciousness is. So I'm an advocate of this bottom theory, despite its, I think, uh, scoring a bit lower on the immediate um, uh, uh, intuitive advantage scale. So according to, to me, um, the, the global broadcasting and the formation of a higher order state is something that consciousness does rather than what consciousness is. So I think that higher order views are too intellectual. They require too much in the way of, of, uh, of intellectual activity that consciousness is something simpler. Important thing to remember in this debate is that the uh, biological and global broadcasting views can recognize a kind of consciousness, a higher order thought consciousness, that is distinct from the primary phenomenal consciousness that they're about. And then the, the idea is that they can, they can allow for top-down effects of that high order state, and, those th and that can satisfy some of the advantages that the higher order people like to talk about, like the idea that knowing about your, your wine can make it taste different. If you can have these top-down effects, um, then on any of the three views, you can explain how learning what tannin is in wine can uh, change the actual taste experience. So, um, um, the, um, uh, so the, 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 uh, the higher order thought view doesn't have a, 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 um, uh, a lock on that, on that point because the other views can recognize a special additional kind of consciousness. Um, so um, the challenge to the higher order view would be to find additional um, empirical points in favor of, of the view. So for now what I'll do is move to the explanatory gap. Um, so what is the explanatory gap? So there is this question that we can ask, which is, well, I suppose here I'm, I'm looking at a blue thing and I have an you know, experience of something that's blue. So the question arises, why is that um, uh, the, the neural basis of that experience, the neural basis of that experience rather than some other experience or none at all. Okay, so it's a puzzling question. 
how are we going to explain that? that uh, what's the explanatory answer there? And uh, many people feel that that is a genuine question, um, and that it's a deep problem because not only can no one think of an actual solution, but no one can think of a, even a hypothetical solution. And uh, my colleague, um, Tom Nagel, has uh, put this in the following way, um, which is the experience is subjective, the brain is, state is objective, and it seems puzzling that something subjective could be something objective. And that there seems some need for some kind of an account of how that could be true. Um, so there's, there's a big issue uh, there that uh, philosophers have written a lot about, but there does seem something genuinely puzzling there. Um, now, if you think that there is, there, well, first of all, let me say that I think it just should be undeniable that there seems to be a deep problem here. Maybe that deep problem is some kind of a confusion, but at least there seems to be a deep problem, so there has to be some response to it on the part of the three theories. So I think there really is a deep problem here. Um, and I think a problem with the global workspace and higher order accounts is it's a little hard to see on those accounts how they can acknowledge the problem. So the global workspace has an view has an answer. The experience of blue is phenomenally conscious if and only if it is globally broadcast. That's all that neuroscience can explain, how it's globally broadcast. But that doesn't seem to acknowledge the deep problem. Um, and the higher order account is, there's this, uh, I'll get to the special kind of causation of the higher order thought about the experience. And again, there's nothing more for nervous science to explain. Um, so there's a short argument against those two views, which is only the biological view can recognize the depth of the explanatory gap. So it's it's better view. Um, the Another way to put it is uh, David Chalmers has made a distinction between the hard problem of consciousness, which is the explanatory gap solving, closing the, the problem once closing it. He's distinguished between that and the easy problems having to do with the function of consciousness. And the problem for the global workspace and the higher order account is that both try to reduce the hard problem to the easy problems. So the idea is that. Um, explaining global broadcasting is an easy problem. Not that it's really easy, but it's not as hard as the hard problem. Um, and causation, the way an experience causes a higher order thought about it, that um, again is a problem about the function of consciousness, how it has effects. Um, and that's another easy problem. And so both the global workspace and the higher order view reduce the hard problem to easy problems. Um, let me say, by the way, that um, if you have questions you know, or comments, um, you should feel free to ask them. Um, how do you usually do this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you we'll just say, because uh, yeah. I don't think this terminology has come up before, but if you yeah. read the batting paper, uh -huh. um, what do you mean by phenomenal conscience? Yeah, I'm going to get that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, uh, thank you for. Um, um, okay, so um, here, so I will. So look, there's always a decision as to you know, that. Of course, is it like what in the world that's supposed to mean? It's not like a minor issue, uh, but there's the question of when when to get to it. So I, I will get to it in a minute. Um, okay, so um, suppose you. Um, so according to the higher order view. Um, what it is for um, uh, a um, uh, state of seeing an apple to be conscious is for a representation of the, say, redness of the apple um, to be accompanied by a thought to the effect that you're seeing an apple and that this has the aboutness relation to that. Um, so on the higher order account, um, all those ingredients can exist unconsciously. Um, and this is a consequence of the higher order view itself, something that higher order theorists uh, often uh, comment on. We can have unconscious perceptions, representations of a red apple. 
We can have unconscious thoughts, and those unconscious representations can be about things. Um, so all those ingredients can exist unconsciously. And if you have a, a neural account that explains what thought is, what aboutness is, and what what something what it is for something to represent red, you can put those together and you'll get an account of consciousness according to them. But nobody thinks that a neuroscience view will predict anything, you know, wowee happening when these three things happen together. Those are just the ingredients of what consciousness is. And so it's another way of seeing that the higher order view doesn't seem to have anything to say about the explanatory gap. Um, okay, so now I'm going to. Um, oops, things are um, turned around here. Um, but anyway, so now I'm going to get to the uh, problem that Alex raised, which is what this phenomenal consciousness is. And one way to put it is you have these first order and higher reviews, but what exactly is the difference? And you can see the problem this way, which is that so you have first order views, so here's. Me, an exponent of the biological view, and Stan Hahn, an exponent of the uh, global uh, workspace view, and then there's David Rosenthal, an exponent of the high order view. So we say there are two kinds of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness and reflective consciousness. He says there's one kind of consciousness, that phenomenal consciousness just is reflective consciousness. But this is a useless way of distinguishing between them because what what we, the first order theorists, say is a phenomenal consciousness without reflective consciousness, he, the higher order theorist, just calls a case of an unconscious quality. So he allows two things, too. So we say there are two things. There's phenomenal consciousness, there's reflective consciousness, and in principle, you could have perhaps phenomenal consciousness without reflective he says, well, yeah, I believe in those two things. It's just the first thing you call phenomenal consciousness. I call unconsciousness, unconscious representation of a, of a, a quality like a, you know, redness. So it seems like the views are on a par, just different how they apply the word conscious. So um, how are we going to distinguish between those things? Well, here's something one might say. From the first order point of view, Phenomenal consciousness is first order. Reflective consciousness is higher order. Um, and of course, we're asking what phenomenal consciousness is. But one thing we could say with um, um, my colleague Tom Nagel is that it's what it's like to see a sunset, or what it's like to t taste to see a, a red apple, or what it's like generally. But that's useless too because we want to know what is this what it's like. So this is really a problem that dogs all discussions of consciousness is the main thing to be explained that can become a little elusive exactly what it is. Um, so here is an attempt by a, a John Searle, a famous philosopher at Berkeley, to get around this problem. He says, consciousness does not admit of a definition. Nonetheless, it is important to say exactly what we're talking about because the phenomenon of consciousness that we are interested in needs to be distinguished from certain other phenomena such as attention, knowledge, and self-consciousness, and he might have added higher thought consciousness. By consciousness, he says, I simply mean those subjective states of sentience or awareness that begin when one awakes in the morning from a dreamless sleep and continue throughout the day until one goes to sleep at night or falls into a coma or dies or otherwise becomes, as one would say, unconscious. Now, of course, this is just a way of pointing at consciousness. If you're not sure which of a number of things is, is being pointed at, the, the presence of this word here is going to make the thing useless. Um, so it's not clear that that helps. Um, so the thing is, it's one of these cases where some people seem to feel like, OK, I see, at least conceptually, the distinction between phenomenal consciousness, that's what, that, what, that what its likeness of perception, and a higher order thought about it. Some people say, and I say, I can certainly conceive that maybe what it is for a state to be phenomenally conscious is for there to be a higher order thought about it. But I see the conceptual distinction. Other people say, 
I'm not sure what that phenomenal consciousness is, if it's something distinct from what you get if you plug in the higher order of thought about it. And so there is a kind of divide where people argue with each other, but it's not entirely clear that they're arguing about <coughs> a non-verbal issue. Is the issue just some people like to use the word consciousness in a different way from others? So look, <coughs> this, this is a difficult issue, and I'm not sure that I'm going to say something that will satisfy you. And the problem really is what, what Sir <coughs> says is that the term does not admit of a definition. It has to be pointed to. If you are unsure whether what that arrow is pointing to, then you are going to be unsure what the debate is about. But there are a couple of <coughs> things one can say. So one thing one can say is just appeal to the explanatory gap itself. So it's what is puzzling. If, so here's a, a little exercise. If you think the explanatory gap really is puzzling, um, then you'll think that um, the, um, uh, uh, the higher order and the, um, uh, the global workspace accounts really need something out. They don't have, seem to have room for explaining it. Of course, the biological view has room for explaining it, but it's not clear that it can explain it. But at least it gets the, if you believe in the gap, at least it gets the existence of the gap. So there are two other uh, well-known uh, um, um, issues that could be brought up to um, um, each of which is itself um, uh, controversial. Uh, so the basis of what Mary learns, that's another way you can uh, get at it. So this is a, a, um, a famous example of, uh, produced by Frank Jackson. So the idea is you're supposed to imagine a, um, um, uh, a neuroscientist named Mary who is raised in a black and white room and never sees anything red, let's say, or is it blue, right? Blue here. A uh, blue. Never sees anything blue. Um, then, so she learns what the experience of blue is from a, a neuroscience point of view, from a computation point of view, from every point of view that science can, um, uh, can give her. Um, and then she leaves the room and learns a new fact, what it's like to see something blue. So, Jackson argues, there must be facts about color vision that are not physical functional facts. He argues for a kind of dualism. But whether you believe the arg argument as an argument for dualism or not, um, at least you can identify, so there she is, I'm so glad to see something blue finally. But at least you can say phenomenal consciousness is the basis of what she learns. So even if you don't think it's an argument for dualism, you can think, ah, yes. When she sees something blue, finally, what it is for her to learn what it's like to see blue is for her to have a certain kind of phenomenal experience. So that is a way of kind of pointing to what's meant by phenomenal consciousness. So the third way is what's important in suffering. And this is something I'll get onto. I think there is a case to be made that a dog, a one-year-old baby, um, an autistic kid, and deaf children who seem to acquire higher order states uh, uh, well after other children. In the case of, uh, of dogs, and, and in the case of dogs, maybe they never do. One-year-olds seem to not have anything you could call a higher order state. Now, deaf children are, are a little delayed in, in, in showing signs of higher order states. Um, so the question is, can these creatures have, have suffering? Um, and if they can, um, um, that suggests that um, there is a fault with the higher order of account, because it looks like suffering is bad in itself, whereas higher order theorists have to say that in these people and creatures, it's unconscious and so only bad in, in its effects. Um, so this uh, a point of view has actually been embraced by one higher order theorist who says, pains in cattle, sheep, pigs, and chickens are not felt, that is, they're not conscious pains, and hence are of no moral significance. I should say he later takes it back, but only, that is, takes back the idea that we don't have to pay attention to how the conditions that we keep these animals in. But he, he does it not because he thinks their pains are felt, that is, conscious, 
but because he thinks their desires are of moral significance. Um, so you could one way to point at phenomenal consciousness is to say it's the basis of what's bad about suffering. It's that feeling of suffering that's bad. Um, okay, so just to summarize these, these three points, uh, Mary learns what it's like to see red, not what it's like to think about seeing red. So that's a way of pointing. Um, uh, the subject of the explanatory gap, representation and thought are not completely mysterious from a scientific point of view. So it's a little hard to see how cashing out the explanatory gap in those terms is going to do anything. And the suffering point that I, that I just made. Anyway, the, the general issue is, um, oh, sorry. So maybe, maybe I should pause for a moment. Um, so, anybody, any questions? Can you explain how the biological view um, can answer the explanatory gap in a way that we uh, overlook to this theory of thought? Why is biology view more than yeah. function? Okay, so, um, so the point of view, the, the view of the biological theory is um, that there is an explanatory gap. And that we lack the concepts needed to close it. So the analogy that we people who hold the biological theory like is the analogy with life. Um, so at one point, people could not conceive of how it is that um, 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 some kind of mechanical you know, motions of molecules could be life. And that was because people didn't have the, the needed concepts. So one of the needed concepts was a the concept of a mechanism of reproduction that could go thousands of generations without any serious change. In fact, there was an argument in the 19th century given that reproduction required an act of God because people had the fossil evidence for some creatures of many, many, many generations. But the only mechanisms for copying that they knew about were ones that introduced fuzziness. <coughs> Like you know, the Xerox of the Xerox of the Xerox of the Xerox. So the idea is that the biological account, it's not that anybody knows what the solution is on the biological account, but at least it acknowledges the problem. You know, as Tom Nagel puts it in his discussion of this, we are like the pre Socratic philosopher who is told that matter is energy, but doesn't have the concept of matter and the concept of energy that allows us to see how those could be concepts of the same thing. So the biological account doesn't say that we have a solution to it, or even that we know how to get it. But the idea would be it's better to recognize problems that are real than to adopt views that close the door to their solution, which is what the biological theorist thinks about the global workspace and the higher order view. So we biological theorists think there is an explanatory gap. Maybe it can be closed or partially closed. Maybe it can't. But we're in a lot better position to close it if we recognize that it exists. And the global workspace view says it doesn't leave any room for closing it. It just says, oh, well, there'll be a causal process by which, um, uh, which we already know a lot about, by which a representation, a perceptual representation, is you know, globally broadcast. And the higher order view says there will be a, a, a causal process by which a higher order thought can be formed at a, a first order state. So they don't leave room for it. So that's the picture. Yeah. The Cyril, the Cyril's uh, idea of, of emergence, I know it doesn't solve the problem of this explanatory gap, but does not sort of like posit a space where that can be like fruitfully explored? Well, okay, so Searle's, Searle's view is, is a little hard to uh, ascertain. So what he says is that consciousness is a higher order property of the brain. But when he says what that comes to, it looks like he's a dualist. <coughs> so he's a little vague on this. He doesn't like the standard categories. So um, now he doesn't really say much about what kind of dualist he is. Um, and so it's a little hard to know exactly what room he leaves for closing the explanatory gap. Yeah? So, 
So what line of reasoning would these characters to suggest that there isn't uh, that phenomenal sense of pain in the an hand? Um, I mean, what, what kind of evidence would he marshal in order to see that? Carothers. Carothers. Yeah. Would he mar marshal to argue that there is? That animals do not experience uh, pain. OK. What he would do and what he has done is um, look at the literature on metacognition in animals and argue that the inherent evidence for metacognition is, is poor. And that first order, so what he, he argues, and I think with some persuasion, some persuasive force, it's in a recent issue actually of Mind, Journal Mind and Language, is that certainly outside of primates, the, the evidence for metacognition is extremely weak. Um, there is some evidence, and then he goes through it and tries to show how um, a first order account really does do a better job of dealing with the evidence. And so he thinks that you know cats and dogs, et cetera, just don't have thoughts about their perceptual other states. Now, I think it isn't necessary to have such an extreme view to see the problem. If those thoughts are possible but rare, um, still we think, you know, if you ever step on your dog's tail, you know, you really think that the, the dog is suffering. And the question of whether the dog is suffering does not at least intuitively seem to depend on whether the dog has managed to have a higher order of thought about his, his state. Um, so I think, you know, there is an open empirical question here. It's the extent of higher order thoughts or higher order of states in, in, in animals. And, you know, there is a, a, a literature, and he, he just gone through quite a bit of it. And it is surprising just how weak it is. Although maybe not so surprising when you look at the literature on uh, human children, where, it, again, there is, and I'll, uh, if I get to this, I'll, I'll mention some of it, um, evidence that to a surprising extent, Human children, up to even the age of four, have a lot of difficulty with higher order states about their first order states. But I don't think we have any problem in, in realizing that they have conscious states, conscious visual states, conscious pains, etc. Um, so it leads you to think that there really is a kind of a pun here that, OK, maybe maybe without the higher thought, they're not conscious in this reflective sense. But surely they're phenomenally conscious. Um, so that's my view. My view is that um, for uh, children, if you, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get to some of this, this work, um, and there's some other uh, uh, strange cases that I'll mention. How much, what time is it? Um, it's a couple minutes before quarter two, so you have about 12 minutes left. 12 minutes left? Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so I think I better. Okay. So let me just, um, 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 so I'll mention just a brief, um, so I really have to skip around. I, I, I seem to overestimate how much time I have. So this is some work by um, Israeli neuroscientist Rafi Malik, where he showed people a movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and found surprisingly small, these are, these are the front side, this is the front, and this is the front of the left hemisphere, front of the right hemisphere, big activations in the back, very little activation in the front. And then he did another experiment, even more impressive, where he showed the uh, subject a rapid series of, of pictures that they had to very quickly identify in a kind of rote way. <coughs> he found, not only did he find little activation in the frontal areas of both cortices, but he found suppression. Suppression um, 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 uh, frontal uh, activity, and he, um, so sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm going so fast, I'm not describing. He did two uh, experiments. Quick pictures, uh, quick identification of pictures, uh, uh, one experiment, the, using the same pictures slower, um, questions of re how you react, what your, re what your evaluation of the pictures were. There he found big activations in frontal areas. Um, in the quick categorization, he found suppression of frontal areas, um, which he, he says um, um, here um, uh, is compatible with the strong intuitive sense we have of losing ourselves in a highly engaging sensory motor act. Um, 
So some empirical evidence that um, 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 in uh, conscious experience we might not have higher order states. So since I don't have much time, so let me um, just very quickly uh, talk about a kind of a weirdness in the higher order view. So according to the higher order view, what it is for a pain to be conscious is for there to be another state that is about it. Um, that makes the pain conscious. What it would be for this state to be conscious would be that there would be another state about it. What it would be for that state to be conscious would be for there to be another thought about it. Um, but the last one in the series would be unconscious if there was no further thought about it. And so, in general, higher order thoughts cannot be conscious because we can't have just an infinite array of them. So this leads to the question, why should being the object of an unconscious thought make a state, another thought, or a desire, or a pain conscious? Why should the source of all consciousness be something unconscious? That's a puzzle for the higher order view. Um, so let's see. A, um, here is a second puzzle. Suppose you have a sensation of green that causes a higher order thought to the effect that you have a sensation of red. What's the phenomenology? Does the phenomenology go with the first order state, the sensation of green? But then you might wonder why you need the higher order state at all for consciousness. Does the phenomenology go with the higher order state? If so, what's the difference between having a conscious pain and thinking you have one? Maybe with both, but there are two different color phenomena. So I, I take this to be a serious kind of incoherence in the higher order view. It's not clear whether the, oh, and by the way, Alice Byrne is the person who first thought of this problem for the higher order view. Um, does the phenomenology go with the first order state, the second order state, both? None of them seems to be um, adequate. Um, so, now, this may seem to be a kind of abstract problem, um, but actually, it's a real problem. And I, um, there, it's a real problem because there are these bizarre um, 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 neurological syndromes in which um, um, uh, subjects have higher order states that are quite at odds with their first order states, at least apparently. One of them is Anton syndrome, where people are blind, but they vociferously deny being blind. This is a picture of Mr. Anton. So I won't read this whole thing. Um, so this is a case of peripheral blindness. The patient had no visual acuity or light perception in the right eye, um, but she, ins she insisted that she wasn't blind on the right side and could family the response. Most of the patients who have Anton syndrome are completely blind, but insist that they're seeing. Now, one issue in this literature um, is, um, are, are these patients having some kind of a hallucination? So I'll just very quickly show you a little movie of one of these patients. So this is an Italian, and I, I don't know how the sound's hooked up. So his left arm is paralyzed. He's depressed, very bored. All these patients seem to be depressed. So he's trying to move his left arm. See, he says he's moved it. OK, so what you see with these patients is 
for a variety of syndromes, they have some problem, like they can't move their left arm, but they think they've moved it. Now, in some cases, there's evidence for hallucinatory movement, but there's good reason to think in a number of the cases that what's going on is a mechanism called confabulation. It's a disorder of thought. Um, they Something to do with having a certain image of themselves makes them um, think that they can do something when they can't. And uh, so a lot of the, um, um, uh, <clears throat> the work in this area is a matter of trying to um, um, uh, show what the causes, the particular causes are. Now, unfortunately, I have some other films which I don't really have time to show, but um, so the cases that illustrate that it's not always hallucination are um, cases where you can see in one way or another the workings of the um, confabulation mechanism. Um, for example, let's see. So there are patients who, with brain damage who um, um, uh, seem to be um, uh, lead, lead uh, um, uh, this kind of cognitive distance. In the case of anosognosia for prosopagnosia, um, this is a case where prosopagnosia is the uh, brain damage cause inability to recognize faces. Um, the, um, or it can be congenital as well, and actually it turns out that something like 2% of people are congenitally prosognosic, probably something you know. I'm a little bit prosognosic myself. Um, so, but people can be prosognosic and insist that they're recognized face. I have a little um, 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 protocol, which I don't have time to show you, of a patient who was a painter, and she's shown her own paintings of people and cannot recognize them. But she can sometimes figure them out. And the, the, the protocol shows how she confabulates in order to convince herself that she really can recognize the people. Um, another uh, fact is that sometimes you can ask these people, um, um, uh, once they've recovered, what was going on when, um, uh, when they were um, um, uh, having the, the problem. And they can um, say, look, Actually, I wasn't seeing anything, or I wasn't. I know I wasn't raising my arm, but I was hoping that it would go up, and that's why I said it was going up, something like that. So they, they will say, and they'll explain what was going on in a way that suggests that it was kind of um, confabulation. So here's the deal: there they are having the higher, order, apparently having the higher order thought to the fact that they're having a certain experience, but they're not having the experience. So this is. Empirical, empirical filling in of Alex's point that there can be this conflict between the um, high order and the first order. Um, so let's see. Um, um, Well, I guess I only have a few minutes left, so, um, what, like two minutes left? Yeah. Let me just switch to something completely different. Um, so, on the case of little children, sometimes people don't realize just the extent to which, the amazing extent to which, small children have trouble thinking about representational states and representations more generally. Here is a, um, uh, a little movie of a one-year-old Trying to, pick, oh, sorry. trying to pick up the pictures off of a book. This is very widely observed in, in one-year-olds. So the kids just don't understand that it is a representation. That, and these problems are not just about representations, but about representational states, generally. Um,
Well, I'll show you a slightly different kind of thing here. So these are a little, these are kids, older kids. These are like two or three. Kids this age routinely think that they can get into cars <laughs> or slide down slides. I mean, you know, really, it's an astonishing thing when you see a large child trying to do this. They don't understand the difference between something that's a representation and the real thing. Um, so here, I'll give you one more, please. So this is a kid going to, there's a slide, he's going to try to slide down the slide. <laughs> um, okay, so the general issue here is that, um, um, uh, a wide variety of experiments show that kids have trouble forming um, mental states about representations in these cases and um, more generally about representational states. There is evidence that kids have a harder time knowing about their own representational states than they do knowing about closely related skills, for example. So just in one experiment, um, um, kids, uh, this done by Marjorie Taylor, um, kids were um, uh, taught to count in Japanese, and when they were asked, um, these American kids taught to count in Japanese, when they were asked how they knew the Japanese word for, how they, where they learned to count, they would say that the experimenter uh, just taught them. But kids who were first asked first um, how they knew the Japanese word for two, say, th thought that they always knew it or gave random answers. So they seemed much less good much more what sometimes is called source amnesia for their mental states than their skills. Um, so look, the general point here is that um, um, uh, there's very good reason to think that these children have um, conscious perceptual states, um, uh, conscious pain, conscious, all kinds of conscious states, but their capacity to have higher order States about those states seems limited. Um, and we have other evidence. Um, uh, so just to try to sum up the evidential situation, um, we have evidence for a um, um, for higher order for discrepancy between um, in, in the, those um, brain damage cases between higher order, the contents of higher order states and the contents of lower order states. And then there were these uh, kind of um, um, Coherence problems in the higher order point of view. So my general thought is that of these three the uh, 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 ways of looking at uh, scientific uh, theories of, of uh, uh, consciousness, the, the biological the global workspace and the higher order one, I don't think I think the higher order one is the one that works most well. Um, as between the global workspace and the biological account, um, uh, that uh, is. Topic for uh, further investigation. <laughs>